it's wonderful to see friends that I've had for years here tonight and also those who are, have been ex-students who have survived me uh, as friends now. Um, it's wonderful to see them here. So welcome. It's wonderful to see all of you here and I'm looking forward to presenting a number of works tonight. Um, I would beg your forgiveness in one a a area alone and that is that I flew in from Helsinki where I was teaching last year um, for a one night lecture at Bartlett and flew out again the next morning very early. And so I showed a few things there and I've been encouraged to show them here because many of you may not have seen them. I'm going to show you one building that real architects do and I'm going to show you a number of other things that I like doing. And I did them both but uh, it is a matter of scale. And I have been working largely on fairly small scaled things. And I recognize that real architects don't continue in their lifetime working on small scaled things. But you know in my country one of the biggest difficulties we have is trying to define where we are. Now it's nothing about nationalism and it's nothing about anything to do with being Australian. It's about trying to find an appropriate architecture of place. My place happens to be Australia and therefore I'm trying to find an appropriate architecture that belongs. But again I stress it's nothing about flags and it's nothing about nationalism. It's entirely about trying to discover what makes the place and what can be appropriate to that place that's not going to destroy it. As architects, one of the greatest problems we face, and very few of us think about it, it is that no matter how beautifully we design something and no matter how beautifully it is constructed, chances are it is creating a great destruction of some other place. In other words, the sourcing of our materials, generally, as a profession, we are destroying somewhere that may be absolutely wonderful. From our aluminium that requires 142 megajoules to process for a kilogram, compared with a renewable resource of timber at source at one megajoule per kilogram and five megajoules per kilogram for dressed timber. Human effort is a renewable resource. But on the other hand, the 142 megajoules it takes to, to process aluminium for one kilogram, aluminium can be recycled in itself. It can be changed, as glass can be. The most important thing about all of this, of course, is that we put the materials together in an appropriate way so that when we pull them apart, they can come apart properly and be reused. In a building I did in 1974, and I can't show you everything because I have done well over 300 and something projects, I can only show you a few at any time. And the ones I'm showing tonight are those most appropriate for my practice at the moment. But that project I did in 1974 for a client, and I might add, that project I've since bought, and I recommend to every architect here, the, 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 the coward's way to design one's own house is to design it for a client and buy it 10 years later. <laughs> it saves you a hell of a problem. <laughs> and I made alterations to that building, and in doing that, those alterations, the marvellous thing was that I had to affect the theory of pulling apart a building and putting it into new configuration. And I'm pleased to be able to inform you that I didn't lose a single thing in the building and everything was really reused appropriately. And I think I can qualify that with people here that have seen it. So the issue is that the, the, the whole process of design is also a consideration of process of construction. The idea of how we put things together so that we can pull them apart and reuse them. The cities as we've understood them have required immense energy immense energy and the city as we know it may well be on the decline. There are very good examples historically of cities that haven't existed and have, don't exist any longer. Cities may very well fail as we understand it and it may be for the very reason that computers allow us to do things almost anywhere. I was designing buildings in Melbourne whilst I was in Helsinki. 
I was able to fax that information back to the people I was associated with there. And so the process meant that I can design almost from anywhere so long as I know the place I am designing and the program that I have before me. I could probably give a lecture without showing any slides. Um, but I know most of you are creatures of the eyes. Don't forget, however, as architects, we are more than creatures of the eyes. There is a link between the eyes and the mind. And one of the greatest problems for many architects in my country, and I'm sure it doesn't happen in your country, and that is we have the best libraries of international architecture journals in the world. And of course one of the great problems of having these great libraries is the influence that they might present and the influence may be 10 years behind the time. I'm not interested in architecture that is fashionable. I'm really interested in trying to find, in Thoreau's words, the core of truth. I was given at a very early age the whole idea that the mass, and this is a statement by Thoreau again, and it's a quote, the mass of mainly lives of quiet desperation. Their resignation is confirmed desperation. And that was very important to understand that, that when I found desperation in working in practices, I recognized I became unemployable because I found I could get nowhere in practice in offices. I found it too hard. And I recognised that if you're going to have something to say, get out and say it and don't complain. I mean, there's a great nation of whingers we know about, and I wouldn't mention <laughs> where it was, but I came back in Qantas Plan, I'd never heard so many people whinging about the seats. And they all had a particular accent, and I thought to myself, this is not Australia, where am I going? It's a very interesting issue that you can't complain, you get up and do something about it. And there are too many complainers in the, in the world. And if you've got problems with councils, and I'm sure you as architects don't have problems with local authorities like I do. It's, the local authorities must be a pushover in this nation. They all think that it's a pushover in my country. I've had 11 court cases. 11 court cases. What over? Not failing to meet the regulations, but because I'm not designing appropriately. Because my buildings aren't hum are harmonious with the natural environment, that my buildings don't blend. I can assure you as architects, if you haven't had 10 or 11 court cases by the time you're 60, as I am nearly next year, I will be, then th why not? If not, why not? <laughs> because it is absolutely necessary. If, you, if you're going to allow councils to push you around, serves you right. Because when you come to blending and harmonising, the harm, harmony, disparate sounds, and now we come into the legal world, disparate sounds when placed together make a pleasing whole, disparateness is an integral part of harmony. So are you ask the, asking the councils, do you want me to produce harmony or are you asking me to produce monotony? A very important question because councils are asking for sameness. And I'm going to show you a bit of what they're asking for tonight because it is absolutely unbelievable the sort of going back in, uh, dare I say, uh, uh, a guidance by one of your, your uh, most interesting people who gives us a, a rear view of the world. Uh, and just remember that rear view was once modern. Never forget, never forget that the past was once modern. And we as architects are being denied our right to produce architecture of today. By whom? By the people, by the councils, and it's a disgrace. And it's a world phenomena. Now, I'm not asking a world of anarchy. I recognise the issue of a cultural landscape. I recognise the issues of, of scale, of typology, of morphology. I recognise all these, of materiality. All these are vital in our thinking, in architecture. But when we're told what colour to paint a building, and when we're told what pitch of roof it will be, and when we're told about what setback it will be, and remember you, the British, gave us great suburbia, 
You gave us the model for it. And we now relentlessly pursue it. It's our God-given life. We're born with suburbia because we're told the great thing in life in Australia is to the position to own your own house. And you own your own house on your own block of land. And you build to the fear lines with a metre each side and six metres to the street and everything's nicely packaged and everybody conforms and so we have a society that everybody is the same. And it's some very positive things about our largely egalitarian society even still. I mean, you can't move too far outside the norm without getting chopped down uh, quite regularly. But that's one of the nice and quite endearing things about my country is that you can actually be normal and be quite well known outside Australia. <laughs> and you can even be a reasonable person. So it, there is a great benefit in Australia. Look, this is, this is getting impossible. I'm, I better turn the lights on, I better get going. And so I'm going to show you, I, I think the first one's a real building. Uh, no, it's the second one's going to be a real building. <laughs> now, um, I haven't been told where the switches are here to push on and backwards and forwards. And forward. yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. The first project is a house I completed about uh, a year and a half ago, and it's in the Blue Mountains west of Sydney. And one of the things you must understand in Australia is that whilst the, the, the countryside looks so beautiful and almost benign here, uh, in a very short time this is what happens to it. And we had, uh, uh, two years ago, the tremendous burnout around Sydney. And the force of this fire and the heat generated by it is extraordinary. But the other thing that's very important about fire in our land is within the landscape we require the heat to actually propagate plants by burning the seeds and opening the seeds. And there's a great strength in this landscape and at the same time there's a great delicacy. And it, there's a feathering at the edges. And combined with the light, which is so clear, the clarity is incredible. The strength is phenomenal. You get an articulation because of the type of leaf we have that's flat and in the most stressed areas, the leaf turns its face away from the sun, unlike your, your leaves, puts the edge to the sun, and the edge tracks the sun during the day. So it reduces the transpiration. But as a result, it actually defines the tree more clearly, gives a legibility, and it is that legibility in architecture that I am particularly interested. And yet, at one level within this environment, here, of where I'm going to be showing you the area of the region that I'm building in, is this beautiful quality. But you can get a snowstorm and the sun shining within minutes of one another. Or you can get a heat wave. So the temp this is a thousand metres above sea level. The temperatures can vary in winter time from down, down as far as low as one degree, one degree where snow will settle for about half an hour to an hour and then it'll melt, to temperatures of 38 40, at temperature 38 at 40, at this sort of level here, it's fairly dry and it's not extremely humid. I'm going to show you a project that does have the humidity. And it is just the most beautiful landscape. And the particular site here, as beautiful as it is, can be burnt out without any notice whatsoever. And yet in Australian forebears, uh, the British brought with them <laughs> the roses, and all the other things that tame the landscape. Because they're familiar and it's most understandable to be able to tame our landscape, this unruly landscape, this landscape that has no structure. Like hell it has no structure. It is the most fantastic structure you're going to find in the world. And yet we find here a designing closest to the best architecture in the country. Came very close to the buildings where you've got this lovely veranda which expresses the horizontality, which is a zone between outside and inside where the human is the ant in the landscape and the giant in the built environment. It's a lovely change of zone from one place to the next. But look at this guy wandering around the edge. Look at the depth of the veranda. Nowhere to sit. Look at the way the chairs are faced. Just looking out, looking back to Lords, perhaps, uh, from Australia. 
and all the time in the back of their head thinking about mother country. It's all gone. <laughs> and the veranda, look what happens here. Assume this is north. Remember, north in my country, for those of you who don't know, is south in your country. And, and the northern winter sunshine at midday comes down at about this angle here. Now just imagine in this building here how much warmth of this house would achieve. Just a little bit of sunlight at the edge there. And think of it in summertime, the sun belting down onto here, heating all this area up, belting the heat inside, heat through the roof here. Look at this modest little ventilator. <laughs> They're impossible to live in during the summertime. Totally impossible, but very beautiful indeed. <laughs> Just read what it says here. This is inappropriate, but this one is sympathetic. Look at it. And this is the result. How do you like it? <laughs> I know somebody would like that here, promoting this sort of architecture. I mean, this is what's happening in Australia, the plague. It's a plague that's taken place. And it's a result of this is a council document, a local government document, would you believe, this naivety. Look at it. Just take a good look. And they wanted us to do this up here. And it took me 21 months to get through council. A building on this site, in this rural, this absolutely fantastic site that these people have had for many, many years. And the first ideas show, showed the building with the north at this point here and running along, if I go back, do I do it? Well, yes, the first design, I had the building the garaging this end here and the building running down here to the most magnificent view. But on the other hand, the fall this way as it cut down here became steeper and steeper and it was terribly inappropriate because it wasn't dancing on the site the way I like a house to dance. It became too ponderous, it became too heavy as a feeling. It needed to move. Whoops. Oh, oh. I, I, I knew you wanted to see that one three times. Whoops. Here we are. And so, I'm going through quickly through the development ideas on site. This is now running a, a parallel with the site with a slight fall down this way through here. And I'm now looking at the zone of access. I'm looking now prospect out through into the valley. I'm looking at refuge as containment within here as in the sense of the cave. And I'm entering in a particular way which I'll discuss in a moment. And right at the very early stage, I'm doing details at the design stage. These are all worked out, not afterwards, but right at the beginning. And so that the building starting to develop um, with, the, again, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the garaging through here. This is the rock bending around in this area here. And now I'm showing you what path means. And I discovered in Aboriginal life and the caves, path means everything. The path, the passage is everything. And it's a journey that's very important. And you never enter a cave of Ab Aboriginal paintings that from the front, it is nothing to do with the formality of entering on axis. There is no such thing as the axis as we understand of symmetry. It's a, it is an entry where they called at the edge here for the, for the guardian spirits for entry. And you departed also the, on the edge. You never departed from a cave down this way. And the caves were essentially up on escarpments in the east coast of Australia and other parts of Australia. Uh, well removed from the base where they got shelter and were able to pursue their, their, their wet climate time. Um, one thing I should show you with this here is the bending also, as it showed you with that other um, photograph over, here, over on that other side there, is by bending it allows a view from this space through this way. Now as you can appreciate, north on this particular project is this way here. This is what I referred to as a, a beached whale. It's like a huge, ro it is a huge rock that contains the, the house between the, these two elements and the house slides in between. So you can actually walk through the house here, through and down and down the valley into the valley floor, or you can stop off and into the, into the, into the refuge and look back into this way. And the whole of this door system slides back, the whole of it slides back into here, and the whole room becomes one big veranda. This slides back, this is being north. The water pond here for firefighting allows the sun, the sun that's during the midday, come down here, bounce through there, bounce on the floor, up to the ceiling and down again. Now the other thing that's very interesting to see here is that the trees are very tall and the trees being very tall, the northern sunlight is easily blocked out. So by building in through here, we're, we, we, we're able to 
get an opening in the canopy in this region to allow us for that winter sun penetration and the bouncing of light into the building. These are all the drawings. These are my drawings. I actually still do my drawings by hand. I believe very much in doing drawings by hand because you change so much, you develop so much, and there's an extraordinary quality, I think, between the mind and the hand that you lose in computer. Now, I do use computers, but I do not use computers for working drawings because if you look at these drawings, they are, they are pulled apart, redone. I feel them through the whole time. And when I'm teaching, I now say to my students, you will, until submission, design everything using a pencil. And I make sure they use a pencil because it is extraordinary the difference that's taken place in the last two years I've been teaching, insisting upon this, in the work. It is just amazing because one of the problems is too many students get hooked into the computer so early and they've got all their grids set up and to break from it, whilst it sounds easy, they just don't do it. Laziness sets in and the computer is designed for multi-storey buildings and I've got somebody here who's in computers nodding. And these are again the drawings uh, that are starting to stiffen and harden uh, into from the, uh, and from those details I was showing. And this is the final plan of the building related to, to how the rock actually moves as opposed to the, the, the rock the way the surveyor showed us. And, <laughs> and it, with all the instruments in the world, they don't work sometimes or they just don't take note. And so we have uh, a sleeping space here, a sleeping pace space here, and I might tell you my clients are not 30, 40, or 50, or 60-year-olds, or even 70-year-olds. They're in their late 70s, and an amazing commission that, that they actually would ask for a very modern house. And, and this is a guest bedroom, a bathing space here, a bathing space here, and contained between the two, here's the kitchen, the sitting room, and the dining area. And if you look at this, these are all related. It's a 3.8 it's a grid, 1.9 uh, module through this area here to the 3.8 and the fireplace and all of these all bear relationships the whole way through. And then once you open up all these doors and fold back into that zone and that zone, you have this rock which becomes a very integral part of the house and the water and the, the pond here, which is not for swimming, it is purely for fire, but it's a wonderful thing to have for light. And so in this inclement weather we get up here as well as the heat and, the, and everything else, it was very important to design. This is again, I, I recommend that you really think about the process of how things go together and you get the roof on in my country as quickly as is possible because when it rains, it really rains. You can get up to 300 millimetres in an hour for 10 minutes, which is an enormous amount of water dropping down onto the ground and washing away. And if you've got an excavation and a few walls up, you're in troubles. Whereas if you're able, able to get a roof on, you can continue working, you get drainage patterns on the back and you can able to, able to get the building without destruction to the site. And in the final, fi final product, the, the building in this climate has a brick internal skin. The skin is insulated, metal outside. It's reverse brick veneer. So you give the protection to the thermal mass inside, concrete floor inside. And I've got a heating system that I, that I, de I developed, which has a, a jacket around uh, an open fire. And the jacket uh, has a heat exchange in it and also has gravel built around it. This is the pond. Uh, this, is, this is early stages, it's starting now, these plants are up to this height. The plants are being regenerated of the plants in the area. This is the Eucalyptus um, uh, oreodari, and this is the Eucalyptus black sandii, uh, most beautiful trees that grow in this region. And they, they go silver white uh, at just about this time of year, they're shredding all their bark, and the silver white is very much part of the quality of this here. Gee, I'm going to have to keep going. I'll get on with it. So as you enter the building, and looking back at the twist in the building, the ability to look past through here to the view beyond from the bedroom, and it was a case of that, that if either of them gets sick, it, they've got the, the one of the nicest rooms in the house related to the water, related to the water life, the birds that come down and swoop down onto the, onto the water and take, take little tips from the water. Other birds fly into the water and the animals and lyre birds that come down and, and drink around it. It's really quite marvellous in this sort of region that this can happen. I should go back and just show you one thing here. You can see, perhaps on the other side here, this is where the fires came to in the big burn. And the other thing I want to show to you here in terms of structure, you see how all the trees are looking to this way. They are all facing to this direction. 
Of course, it's where the valley opens, where the skylight is at its highest, and so the trees develop in this way. And the structure of the trees is in a way not unsympathetic with the way I've been dealing with support systems. And the idea of a sloping site coming down this way, you open the lid of the building so that you cap to the skylight with those tall trees here, as well as the dropping way of the valley floor in front. Whoops, I'm sorry. These are all vent flaps so that in summertime the breezes that are coming across the water here picked up and taken in to here. Sometimes used for a garage, sometimes used for overflow space for, for friends and there's also a little pottery area in this, in this end. And then you enter the house along the path. This is with all the doors open. The whole thing blow, blows wide open to the, to, the, to the land and here's the big rock that from, one, from back inside here you feel as if you can step straight out onto it the closer you get to it the, the more elusive it becomes and that's the end of the house uh, this is all stuff to recover now the beautiful plants are starting to develop through here and then looking back from the direction you came and then this is what it's like at different times of the year uh, the, the fog, this was only a few week, weeks ago and then the fog here that really also articulates perspective and the, then, the, then the link walk which floats just above this water line. Looking back to the entrance, and here's the rock as it's very much part with the, with the doors uh, open and the blinds up, and here's with the blinds down and the doors closed. It makes an enormous difference to the quality of space. Then from the, from the back area here, Sheila is, is a potter. Jeelam uh, uh, was the professor of economics, left-wing professor of economics. Well, Sydney, Sydney University was divided into two camps in the School of Economics. There was the left-wing camp and there was a right-wing camp. And Jeelan was, was head of school and he was left-wing, so he had some sense of direction there. <laughs> and this, this is before the pool was filled. It was on its way. In fact, the pool was at this height here when the fires came. You can see the fires in the background there. And so it was emptied and had to be refilled with the rains that came, but it was filled within, uh, within a couple of months of the rains when we even had a drought. And then from the bedroom looking back into the house. Again, you can see it with blinds down and the, the, the room open. Same thing. And then from the water, see what happens to the water and the light that comes in underneath the building. Same thing here. And then the detailing and the structure, and looking at the structure here, and the structure of trees, and some of the closer detailing. This slot here represents that which is part of the building structure. This is the section that takes the blinds. The, the track of the blinds runs in that zone. There it is there. And then on this, we need these sprinkler systems. Picks up the water, transports it into here, overflow, then goes back into the pond and the, in for the firefighting. And we, we, we can go straight from the pond into these big sprinklers, which throw out around about 35 to 40 metres all around the house and wet the whole site. And the, the, then the, the, the detailing here of this window here, you can see how the vent flaps open and allow the ventilation in the very often inclement weather to, to allow the rain to drop down at this level here but the air to pass in underneath. And the water storage tanks, very important in, in this part of Australia. And a reminder, this is what happens in our landscape and it came to this site and the protection was vital. Now this is the house that real architects do. This is a historic house, uh, 1860, Solway was the architect and uh, I did this in association with Robert Bruce of Batesmart in Melbourne and it started, this is a design that, w that I did uh, uh, with Robert in 1982, uh, 83. So it's taken a long time to execute, but that was a result of the client going, wanting to go slow and spending only a certain sum of money each year on the building. This is the entrance of the, to this historic building. Um, this is the, the, the beginning here. You come down to this area here. The whole building was restored. It, it, it's an uh, Italianate number. Um, and uh, it was the seat of the Catholic Church. It was built by a, a, a man in the beer industry and had tons of money and uh, he got Solway to design this building and um, it was furnished in the aesthetic um, 
period and the restoration has been done according to that the client engaged uh, uh, Terry Terence Lane from the Victorian uh, National Gallery t to select furniture all over the world to fit this building and so this is the new building in through here and there it is packing in this area here so you can see this is the existing house this is where we were coming in through here the turning circle come around here you can park into this area here this is the main entrance to the new house it's a semi-public building in fact um, the, uh, the whole of this is used by the public opera is uh, is performed on this building over the whole facade it's two stories high and there's a tower above this area here and it's performed on the on the tower as well and then people sit in the garden through here and this is the ground floor area the courtyard that separates the two we have a, a, a two-story building here and a single story building here I had a, 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 an issue of scale at this point here as it joins into this into this work here as compared with the lower scale through here and by providing a courtyard in between the two we're able to try and uh, certainly attempt to work those scales. On the ground floor is the major entrance which looks through and in Melbourne you get very few distant views because Melbourne is very flat. This is one of the few distant views so you can look straight through this here. We've framed the view into one of the old colleges across the way here which is a beautiful, beautiful old building and you turn and see the stair up to, to level two or you it come up quickly to the bedrooms above here to the bedrooms there. This is a, 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 a swimming pool. There's an existing building through here, which is theirs. We've put in a small uh, tennis court here. There's a croquet garden in through here. And it's been landscaped all through here um, uh, in a, a very traditional way, uh, not what I'd call in any way an Australian way. But it was a historic building, and it then became the seat of the Catholic Church until the Pratts bought this building in about 1980. And uh, the, the, the church decided to get out of the place. They'd had enough of it, and uh, uh, a whole lot of new life was breathed in it. And so you've got downstairs here, the, the dining area, the sitting area, the, the kitchen area here. This is another kitchen uh, for reheating food that's brought in from outside. It comes in uh, underneath here into, into a lift system here, which brought into the back here, and then it can be served here as this becomes also part of a public function. Upstairs here, uh, the, 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 the uh, owner's bedroom, uh, a link directly at this level up into the existing house. This is a link also here when they've got guests coming that they want to have a formal dining for off the main entrance to the existing house. You can come in here, serve directly from there. So this is the link at both levels. And in section, you can see this is the the, the profile, the scale of this is the, where this one links with that and this is where this building links with this. And so I wasn't able to do many of the things that uh, I would normally want because my client said that, uh, she, she said, look, come with me down to Collins Place in Melbourne uh, and said, see this street of glass? Um, I said, yes. She said, I want nothing smaller than this. And then rang me in the afternoon. She said, I forgot to tell you, I wanted to open as well. Um, <clears throat> and so it presented me with great problems uh, I said, look, I don't think I can do this job. Um, uh, it's going to take me a year before I can get on to because I knew they wanted it immediately. And she said, oh, you have to start immediately. And I said, no, I can't do that. And I thought that would be the, would be the end of it. Unfortunately, and I might give advice to all of you who think you, you can't put people back, um, uh, if you put, say, you can't do it now, uh, it makes people want you all the more for some reason or other. <laughs> and so this is a detail of the end of the building through here, through the, through the entrance. And what we developed here were different coloured laminations and peeling off laminations so that as, as the glass gets to the edge of the sky, uh, it becomes uh, quite frail and hardly distinctive uh, to it. And this is the, the garden uh, as an entrance area, um, and this is as you come into it. Um, uh, yes, some of you laugh, so do I. But uh, uh, it, this was restored absolutely lovingly. This is gold. Through here, this is terracotta, the most extraordinary terracotta. It's really exotic. It's really quite exotic. Uh, but the, this is the ballroom. This is the other section of the house. I won't pursue this too long. But the papers, you know, they are really the kingfishers, the dragonflies and butterflies. It's very beautiful. It is very pretty and very beautiful. Uh, it's not very like me, but it's, it's, I can appreciate it. Um, and this sort of stuff... Um, <laughs> and I mean, 
uh, I can't think of anything worse to sleep in. But I, I, honestly, I get nightmares in this sort of stuff. <laughs> Look at I mean, it's exotic. It's really terrific. I know it's terrific. But I hate it. <laughs> and then this is the junction. This is, the, this is now the junction between the dining room and the new building. So there's the new building just appearing. And what I would like to have done would have been to design something that came underneath with great big shutter system all over it to control the light, control the heat this way. But my client said she couldn't stand to have any such thing above her. It would send her bananas. And she just wanted to tear it down, so I accepted that. I appreciate her <laughs> difficulty with that. So what we had to develop was this system of glazing above glazing, so it gave the shading, and then shuttering and blinds that worked on thermal nodes and, and the like. And so this is the entry to the house here. This is also the entry down through in that area there. This is just a service area into the building. You can see how the scale of this building drops to the old building here and the entrance as you enter the building you look through to the view here this is where this wonderful building is over here with this very sharp edge framing that view and then as you turn right you're looking up to the stair the living room dining room kitchen on this side and then into the, into the library on that side and then here you have the, the, um, uh, the, the building it's almost a, a photograph of it if you if we overlay then you get the full width of it but this is the, the, the towards the kitchen area and uh, sitting area, and then as you s you climb the stair up into the main body of uh, sleeping and accommodation there, and then looking from the, the dining room back into the library, or, or or from the library back into the dining area, we had a very tight site to achieve all this, extraordinarily tight. And Graham, there's Robert Smart, uh, Robert Bruce, say. and then here we, you can see the, this is a this is a tinted glass through here and then the layering through here giving the density where we need for the shade cut out but so that this feathers against the sky in the lightest possible way. As we look back to the uh, other stair that moves down from the bedrooms at that end of it and then the, the stair from behind from the dining area. And then on the opposite side to this from the kitchen looking back to the dining. As we climb the stair, this is the link back into all the bedrooms through here, and then the bedroom to the right here, the living room, dining around this side, and then the access into the uh, library that side. Moving into the master bedroom, bedroom, and looking down into the garden. You can see how close the other houses are, but when the landscaping gets all through here, you'll think you're right out in the middle of nowhere. And then some of the bathing spaces. From the end of the building, looking back to the stair that you came up and then moving down to the stair back into the entrance. Into the courtyard, entrance on the other side, and then the courtyard looking at the stair, this is the stair going up to the first floor. And to look at what's happening with the, the relationship of this building, this piece through here, then the taller piece in through here, there's the, there's the lower piece here with the upper piece moving at a junction in a not a dissimilar way at the other end of the courtyard. And then the glazing techniques where you get just a shift of glass, glass, this is all on the south, the whole of this is on the south, which is your north. And then just before it was completed, these photographs were taken, is the, the pool and then looking from the other end from the living and dining back into that pool. And then the house, this is the foliage that uh, has grown in such a short time, then looking up again to these various techniques. A house uh, completed only a couple of weeks ago, um, are very interested in recycled materials. Um, the house, except for the plywood walls, is entirely using second-hand materials, and it's been something of a great interest to me for a long time, because so many of our materials have been thrown away, wasted, dumped, burnt, and to see how I could work with those materials. No toxins in the ground, uh, just using granite guard, a technique developed in Australia against termites, where you can compact this material 
to give you great pressure against the foundations where they can't move, the termites cannot move through it. And it seems, seems to be working very well because the place is infested with termites and it's been going on for about a year. And uh, we, we seem to be pretty, pretty good uh, in terms of, uh, of that. And the entrance is from the st street up here. Disabled fa fa father comes down a ramp, a sitting area here. He has a, a, a lung disorder from the First World War and he, he can't go too quickly so he, he can get a breather here, come in here and he comes and stays in here with his own bathing space for disabled. And then behind here, the kitchen, the sitting, uh, the dining, the sitting. We haven't done the furniture for this here yet. Uh, it's taken before any of that has been completed. Then a veranda here and a two-story uh, void space in here. Insect meshed all the way around. This section being able to be open to the outside but still meshed. And then downstairs and another entry area, the, the stair running, running through here. Uh, so that you, like, there's a sitting area in here, a bathing space, a laundry space and uh, a, a bedroom, bedroom, bedroom. Now they're very, very small bedrooms, very tight. But they all come out onto the garden on a site which you can see is quite steeply sloping and so I'm able to generate a garden at this level which comes up into the void through this level here and then the whole of this roof is a white light of, of, of fiberglass and then I have battens located underneath here to distribute the light and the one way pitch roof here collecting the water all onto the one side and here allowing the morning sunlight to come in here. North is at this end of the house so I have a main living space here and during the whole day uh, until 2 o'clock in the afternoon where the hillside behind cuts the sunlight out is get some beautiful light into the house. And then the, again the detailed drawings of, of set outs that I, I, I complete. And then at the entry down the ramp, to the entry ramp and, and the various uh, directions of boards and drilling for, for uh, holes for water, very important in, in where I'm, I'm living. And so this is, the, as you, this is the entry bridge. Here it is as you arrive in the seat. And looking from the st street, you have to keep it down so as you're walking on the street, you can look out over to the views. This is a light source right through the back of the house. And then this is looking up into the veranda area. Inside, as I said, the furniture hasn't been made for here at this stage, but just the kitchen and the sitting out area and insect meshed all the way around. Looking one direction down into the courtyard and that's looking the other direction to this here. And then you go downstairs, this is the sitting area, the bathroom is up in here and these are bedrooms that come out onto these anterias and quarter lines uh, that are part of our landscape. And the bedrooms through here, there's an access way through here, all these doors slide back into one band here and these all slide back into, into here so they can become one, one large space or it can be divided for guests and friends. And then they, this is what they look out onto, each of those spaces. And then from uh, up top, this is the outlook and from below. Could we just change those carousels, please? And the uh, <coughs> next project I'm going to show is by request from uh, Mosin because it's something I showed in Harvard and it was only by chance I happened to have it with me uh, down down here uh, 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 today because I was going to leave it at home and I thought oh, I won't show this tonight uh, I'll show, show some other things that I've done and so it is by request. Um, this is the work of the painter Fred Williams. It's one of our most wonderful painters who understood the light levels in my country. He understood how the light serves to separate the elements in the landscape compared with Europe on the whole where the light le levels tend to serve, I believe, the elements to connect them rather than separate them. And you can see here how the elements are so isolated and are so clearly articulated and the legibility of the structure of our landscapes and our trees is absolutely paramount. And you look at the fire, this is the thing of, of uh, uh, he calls this gorge landscape. And you can see the articulation almost as if it's the trees are doing the same thing here. And these trees go absolutely white like these trees here are shown during certain times of the year. And it can either be floods in here which gouge out this terrific hole or, like it is here or it can be the dry creek bed. And that's always a reminder to us 
of what happens in Australia, the dry creek bed, the size of it, reminds us of how forceful that water is. And yet out in our landscape here, look at this eucalypt, amazing tree that has this winter bark and there's the summer bark. The summer bark being white repels the, the heat, it reflects the heat, whereas in wintertime they need the warmth and it keeps its clothes on in here and it sheds its clothes in summer. And it always occurred to me why you in Britain don't shed your clothes in your buildings when you can so easily do it because you shed your clothes when you come in and sit in a room. You, you put all your, on all, all your coats when you go outside and you come inside uh, and, and, and you come inside and take them off. Why doesn't the architecture do that as well? And I very much believe in an architecture that has a mobility about it, that can actually breathe, that can take things off and put things on. Our landscape does it and most things do that are, are living, shed coats and shed, shed skins and things like that in the growth patterns and the cooling system. And here is the dry, dry water hole, equivalent to the dry creek bed. And here is the diary of process. And I've become very interested in process. And you can see the same process of laying, laying earth walls does the very same sort of thing in expression of the time it's taken. And this is an expression of after the rain has fallen, the heat that builds up in this rock, minor, minimal uh, evaporation, and so the evaporation gets greater and greater and greater and greater, and as the rock builds up and the heat builds up, so the evaporation between day and night becomes greater and greater, and you can see the salts that come as a result of, of the cooling off uh, and the drying out process uh, during, during the evaporative time. And then this is Broken Hill in central western New South Wales, closer to Adelaide. It's, it's in the hot, arid region of Australia, where you get temperatures during the daytime of 40 Celsius and at, at night time and winter time down to freezing. And the whole uh, uh, psychology of, of this place and the actual operation of it, but in terms of psychology, in terms of, of designing a building and understanding this place, you've got, you're going down underground one mile 200 feet, two kilometres underground where the surface temperature of the rock is 26 degrees Celsius. And uh, in some parts it goes up to 56 Celsius in other parts. Uh, as you go a little deeper, and you look along the town here, and you're seeing all the time the line of load and, and all the tailings coming off uh, and machinery in the top. And I was asked to design a mineral and mining museum for this city. And you see the head frames, and the head frame is the lifeblood and the life source for the miners because they go down through this thing here and they move back up. And it's also the water line, and it's also the ventilation line. It's a very, very important determinant. Of, of mining in this part of the world and the ventilation systems that have been developed in that region. But I recognise they didn't work as well as they ought. So I, I, I then did some research through the, the work of Fatih and found out that these are some of the early malcaps and the more recent malcaps. And the wonderful thing about understanding um, working in the hot arid regions is that we know that the Europeans have a very narrow nose and we know that the people living in the hot countries have much broader nostrils and the very reason for this is that in the, the colder climes the, the whole passages to the lungs require to be narrow because the efficiency of heating air is much greater than having a big passage in a big volume so the air is heated much more efficiently whereas on the equator and the hotter climes you don't need to heat the air you need the ventilation system so the air is able to ventilate better. And, and then when you're dealing with malcaps in the hot arid region, the efficient thing is they're now in reverse, where you get the hot air coming in and you want to cool it, you can add water to it, you can cool the sides of the whole thing down so that you get a very great efficiency in the cooling of the, the air. And it was this system that I, I adopted because of the similarity of climate of Broken Hill to the places where this whole, whole system developed. And of course you must understand how air moves around objects. This has been central to my, my work, is understanding airflow uh, through childhood of model aircraft. I was given at the age of 13 a book by Cam on the principles of flight and those principles of understanding have been with me forever. And to know exactly how air moves around buildings was the way I designed this broken hill with the understanding of the, the cooling systems of the world in, in Iran and Iraq and other places. North Africa as well. And then this is the city of Broken Hill. It is actually an urban place and it's the, this, the site is in this zone here and it's right on the turning point of the main road from Sydney to Adelaide. And <coughs> here we have the old rail, uh, railway museum here. This is housing 
this is the site, and this was the line that connected to Silverton. And from this point on, you look straight to the back here, and you look as if you're lo looking back into the desert. This is the work of Fatih, and then I started with this silly sort of stuff. Um, uh, but it was an idea of how you might deal with going down through the mal caps where you get cooling. And it occurred to me that you might even on the mal cap system, on these plates here, be able to get access to them. And once every few days, be able to get herbs of the desert, the beautiful scents that you get from those herbs, crush them and put them over the plates so that as you walk down the mal caps, they, they breathe this very cool air, beautifully perfumed uh, on you. And one of the central ideas was understanding that in, in, the, in the arid regions, um, you get cropping, in the, and the farmers know how to deal with these sort of things. They just don't know how to build their houses these days, but they certainly know how to build sheds and the appropriateness of sheds. And here you've got, you've got no rain at all, and all you require is a, minimal, a minimum amount of protection. And that became the model for designing a museum in this hot arid region, where we're able to get all the exhibits in through here. We didn't have to air them. We're able to bring the air through here, <coughs> providing northwest northwest winds here. A slot, <coughs> a slot in this area here, which will drag the air down through here, um, increase the air pressure in the flow here, uh, the, the, the velocity through here as it passes through here. We get, get a dragging out of the air here. You're not getting a pull. You're not getting a push in here. You're getting a pull in there, creating the negative pressure. Positive pressure moves to negative pressure, and so you're able to get a very good wind flow. But this being a street, you one has to be very careful not to blow, blow people off the street. And so we had another system to deflect the air out. Uh, and of course, in, in this sort of architecture, one has to be very careful that, you, that it actually works. I'll, I'll show you that in a moment. And here is the, is the line of, this is the, almost like the, 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 the shaft down through the building, which is the access point, which feeds off to the various uh, uh, levels. And <coughs> in here, we've got the the head frame eventually turned around onto the head of the building here. Then the, the entry area, uh, per, uh, the temporary exhibition, permanent exhibition, then a, a hands-on exhibition of machinery, a ramp up to the top or lifts in this area here to get you to the top floor, which was all the external, uh, the old machinery, uh, historic large machinery that was uh, exhibited. Uh, and you can see it going on the line of tailings all the way along. And then eventually we ended up with, with, with this starting to become formalized. This is the, uh, the, the head frame was going to be at this end here, put going down into the winder house here, and then this is where you move through the building as if you're going down the shaft. And of course the Arab world has a lot to tell us about water and water flow and how you get water off buildings uh, and how you can harness water. These are the drawings I do and give to my clients. That's about as far as the presentation I'm, at, I'm generally prepared to go. And then as I presented this, my client, who was very excited, left the room in this board meeting, and I, I didn't know why he had left. It was a, rather a shock, and came back and showed me these two photographs. I hadn't seen these and didn't even know this had existed. And these are, these, these, these are photographs of examples of mining in, the region, in, in, the, in, in, in New South Wales. <coughs> and here is the, the, the windsock. There is the windsock, the very first one on Broken Hill. There's a hole in it, and you're able to put this to the direction of the... Uh, uh, the wind, and the wind would go down that sock and cool down underneath here. This one then was the introduction of water, and you could put it into the direction of the prevailing breezes, and it was also shaded, so you got terrific cooling. Very simple processes. Hello. Uh, that, uh, thank you. Um, and then the section uh, of the building with the air through here, these are the, these are the cooling pot pads uh, collected at this point through here. Uh, any spill over down in here and re recollected and in the, yeah, on these pods where, where it has the perfume. And then the big roof up here allowing you the big machinery, like big, big industrial sheds that are up on the landscape on the horizon, allowing you to have big machinery sitting up through here. You could walk through here and come down various stairs at given points. And then in here, halfway through the, the exhibit, one was able to come out where we had a water table only two metres down, bring the water up and use it for cooling as part of the system as well, and then let it carry on down into town. The idea was to take it right down into town uh, as, as an element from, from this museum. And, and, and the only air conditioning in this building was a, a air conditioning the exhibits, so it minimizes the amount of energy to, to keep the, uh, the, the building uh, open. And <coughs> the most important thing in this sort of architecture is to be able to hold it down as much as holding it up. And if it, I've been to Morocco, and here are these systems of holding down as much as holding up and it was very influential. The engineer uh, on this project was James Taylor, a marvellous engineer. 
uh, that's been who's been working with me for years, about 15, and his father worked with me for another 10 years before that. Um, and I think this one's got a whoops, sorry, I've got the wrong one. I'll go back. Up. Yes, um, the, the, these are the Irwin sensors, and one has to understand the prevailing winds and the, the, the comfort zone for this, and then have the building tested. Um, I've got these on, I'll move that one on. I'm happy. Uh, so what happened is, in testing this, is a, is a, it's a model, and uh, these are all the mal caps that are open and allow the air to move down in through here if it's going to work. Um, ah, that's the end. Aha, <laughs> uh -huh, thank you. That's it, great. And this is the, this is the, where the model is set up for all these sensors. Um, the sensors that then uh, are able to be t be uh, measured the pressure system and binned and then you can get the positive pressure, negative pressure relationship and so long as you have a positive pressure here, negative pressure on this side, you're going get, to get suction and that was extraordinarily important in, in this case of the, the air prevailing was coming this direction here. I see it happens with the thing, things right. And then, if, uh, then it is, they showed me, it actually really worked and they showed me it working, they asked me to come down to Melbourne and they put these flares up uh, smoke bombs to see how it actually worked and this is all glazed in through here, closed in and they put things over the top here and set, the, set this bomb up and got the wind going and then it was only, they, they, they told me to lift this thing off and it was only a matter of a fraction of a second and the smoke was going all through the building. It was really quite uh, marvellous to see and then this is the, the building as it uh, uh, finished up in the model form. So it's probably just as well I've shown you this because I, I do enjoy working on larger scales as well, but being a sole operator, uh, it's a little difficult to get hold of these sorts of scales of projects because they think you can't do it or something. Um, but it certainly takes a little longer. Um, and again, process and all these walls were going to be built of rammed earth, uh, it's, uh, 800 thick on this side, 600 thick on the southern side. the head frame, the entrance here, and the entrance for working uh, uh, staff in that end. The uh, last project, and I'll get through this fairly quickly, I, it's, it's not too bad, is it? The timing, it's a, uh, this, this is a project I have for Aboriginal family up in uh, Eastern Arnhem Land. Uh, I've become very linked with the Aboriginal community in this region of Australia, particularly with one community, the community of Yurikala and my clients, Bandak, Mamba and Marika, uh, and another cl client, um, uh, Dandawoi, uh, uh, Wanman Mara, uh, are both wonderful clients. Uh, I'll show you just a model of a house I am doing. Uh, the construction has already started, but to understand this region, you must understand that the water comes from the escarpments, that they're pretty well impervious, they come down through the water, the rocks, the waterfalls, uh, beautiful, beautiful waterfalls into these these oases, uh, or not oases. In fact, they're they're, they're great ponds. Uh, uh, then distributed out into the wetlands. This is during the during the dry, during the wet, and into the mudflats to the sea. And there are many seasons in Aboriginal life, uh, <coughs> including the burning period and the hunting, which the burning is part of the hunting uh, and uh, uh, the propagation of the plants and to the burnout, you see like this, and then one month later, everything has this beautiful regrowth. The rebirthing is fantastic. And then there's the flowering season and the fruiting season. And one thing to understand in the Aboriginal life is that they're very, very attuned to the, to the, the, the development of, 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 uh, of, the, of nature, the, the nature as they call it. And <coughs> to know that when the eucalyptus miniata is in flower is the time when the Stingray is running, when the stingray is running with the pink liver, not the brown liver. The pink liver gives us beautiful, wonderful nutrients that are non-toxic. The moment the flowers are gone, the livers turn brown and they're highly toxic. 
So to understand this is very important for survival, that there are all these foods, and each Aboriginal person has a totem. They're not allowed to eat their totem. That totem, therefore, represents a distribution of the food. They've survived 40,000 years. Now, this sounds like a political speech, doesn't it? But they've survived 40,000 years through cooperation, not survival of the fittest. And the 40,000 years is a continuous culture, the oldest living culture known on this planet. It's an extraordinary thing for me to become part of this community, to go and hunt with them, to fish with them, to gather with them, and live with these people is the greatest privilege I could think of in any human's life, uh, to be invited to become part of it, because the European has absolutely destroyed their faith in human nature, and to be, as a European, a balander, as I'm known as, uh, to these people, and to be, be brought into the family is very, very remarkable. I'm given such information, some of which I'm able to, to give to you and others that I'm not able to discuss. And to see the kids playing, and playing in a way that's almost traditional, that there are things that they throw for survival, to catch things, to actually move through and catch periwinkles, or to stand and observe. Aboriginal people are great observers, are great, great observers, and I love being an observer as well. And we have something very common. And here's a kid lying in the beach being black, it's very hot. It get the heat penetration in the black skin is extraordinarily uh, 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 great. And they get very, very hot, not getting sunburnt, but very hot. And so here he is lying down, he gets wet and puts sand all over his body and he feels much more comfortable. It's very interesting to understand these things and to be able to go and, and play in, in their method of play in the, in the billabongs and water places and the catching of fish and the genuine catching and, and the gathering of oysters out in the coral reef on her land and the finding of turtle eggs and, and the gathering and eating of turtle eggs uh, with these people is a privilege. And the landscape, here is my client, Marmbra, gathering oysters in this extraordinary land of, of hers, uh, and she, she, which she has now land rights to. And then in, in from this, up some of the, the, the rivers where the crocodiles are, there are crocodiles all through this area, uh, and the crocodiles up in this region of these mangrove forests. Uh, I, I qualify the word forests. They're not swamps. They are forests. They're absolutely living, dynamic places. And they're the most extraordinary parts of the ecosystem uh, and the ecotones of that region, uh, giving great life <coughs> to, to the planet. And in the cave country of the, the Quinkin region, or in... In the, in the Arnhem Land region, the, 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 the area of going under these rocks here and coming to these extraordinary caves, and I have permission to show these photographs to you. And the Dighton Lady and Ibis, just the most remarkable works of art by these people, the Aboriginal people of Australia, that have been dismissed out of hand so unfairly, so unreasonably, so irrationally. The real issue of diversity in this land is so important, as I discussed early earlier about the diversity of architecture and ideas and the diversity of landscape is our survival. It's very important and diversity of people and cultures is vital and yet we all want a homogeneous uh, culture and we want everybody to fit into our culture rather than understanding the differences in cultures and the richness that can be gained from understanding the differences in cultures and the joy of difference. We understand the joy of difference in food, why don't we understand the joy of difference in dress, the joy of, the joy of difference in, in ideas, the joy of difference in colour and everything else. These are traditional Aboriginal houses I just showed you. There, that's what, that's what, that, oh. Oh, there we are, got it. Um, that's, that's, the, that's some of the traditional architecture that they, they build through here. It's just four posts, some rails, a mid, midpoint here, like this here. And this is what we've been giving them for years. And this is the plan of what, what, what we're given. The Aboriginal people are extraordinarily, excruciatingly, excruciatingly private people. And look what we've done. We come in through the laundry here where, where they're washing babies' nappies. You've got the toilet on one side here, the shower on the other side, and this is the, this is the sitting room. They generally use these buildings as lockups to put, put possessions in, and they live outside. And we, 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 say to them, we say to them, you don't appreciate what we give you. And they burn them down and say, what's wrong with you? Well, the issue is I'd burn the damn things down as well, get to live in this climate and those sorts of buildings. And yet we got it pretty right at some one stage. Again, we did get some things right. The ventilation system, the ability to open the building up, a room here that ventilates. This is the very system I'm using in a house up there right now. We get some sense of privacy. In we're going to get natural ventilation. You can't get everything. You can't get a hermetically sealed space, for instance. Therefore, you get a loss of acoustic privacy. Well, your loss of acoustic privacy is one of the losses. 
to a lot of other gains, very important gains. And a building that's a model to me is this building here. Look at this here. That's what it's like inside. That's what happens to this building. 32 millimetre planks, 8 millimetres gap. Look through that there, and that's what you get on the outside. So you can enjoy a great level of privacy with this down, but get it ventilating at the same time. It's a marvellous system. And some of the, 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 the models of buildings up there, the Aboriginal people quite like this, this big house here that opens out onto verandas. But this church did have walls, did have glass in the walls. Well, between the Aboriginal people and the cyclones, the glass didn't last too long and it's never been replaced. And understanding this part of the world, you must understand the climate. In January and February, you can see the winds are coming in from the northwest through here. Then they turn around to the southeast in the dry. This is, this is coming in during the summer period where the humidity is high. This is coming in the winter time where the humidity is low. The high humidity is accompanied by temperatures in the order of 32 to 33 degrees Celsius. In winter time, accompanied by temperatures of 20 to 25 degrees Celsius. And then the various ideas on how you might deal with, with buildings in this landscape about where petitions and how petitions might go through in relation to prevailing breezes and how you might have privacy and wall, wall systems to allow the air to pass through or compressing air to speed it up over occupation like you do in a venturi, uh, ideas that one pursues only to give them point or having a group of buildings around here that have different functions or a group of buildings on a walkway like this which can be very, very wonderful but when I designed a building and started pursuing this, my client said that she was very happy with it up to this point. And then she said to me one day, and how are you going to stop the prevention of, uh, the, of entry, the entry of evil spirits? And I said, tell me more about these evil spirits, Marmara. She said, well, I've got two, two issues about this. One is that there are poison relatives. Poison relatives are equivalent to in-laws and the like. Uh, <laughs> uh, but they are ge generally genetically, people and families gen generally genetically too close to you. Uh, you have to be a poison relative. You can't make contact in the Aboriginal community with poison relative. Uh, either, uh, either by voice or by uh, casting of eye. And <coughs> the evil spirits are here every night, every night except for full moon. And she said, if I want to go to the bathroom up here and I'm sleeping here, have I got to walk outside? And I said, yes, you do. She said, well, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be got by the evil spirits and I can't do that. So it, it throws out entirely this as a, as a po possibility of design, yet it's so appropriate for the tropics. Again, looking at separation of, of children at this end, parents at this end, which wasn't necessary. Uh, the parents always to the west, the children to the east. Being to the west is, is the, day, the end of the day, it's death. Uh, old people to the west, children to the east, birth. Uh, a very, very important relationship always in Aboriginal life. I appreciate your know, designing a building, giving them that possibility so they feel very comfortable about the parents seeing the sunset and the children seeing the sun rise on that side relationship. Another idea here was for the poison relatives that we, and other relatives, you could have these pods that could come, you could stack them all down here, and depending upon how many poison rels you had, you could, you could stack it up through there. But uh, uh, <coughs> Not terribly practical, but it's it it an idea. Now, the important thing about bad ideas is get them over now and don't get them built and then find that they're bad. And if I have any ability whatsoever, if I have any ability whatsoever, let me assure you of one thing. I know when it is still very bad. If, when it gets built and it's still bad and I didn't know, then that's my problem. But I can assure you, I generally know when it is still very bad. And it often takes a lot of exercise and a lot of thinking to take something out of the, out of the mediocre. To do ordinary things extraordinarily well is something very important to me. To know when it's very, very ordinary is fine, but to do it very well is very, very important. Not to go and try and do difference for difference sake because it leads nowhere. Difference can only come as a result of dissension where you've actually, actually got a position and you can make a challenge to the ex existing position. And here I am now testing the ideas about how a plan might develop, how you can come along the road here, slide up on this side here, come into the house, the sitting platform, the whole of this opening, so this becomes a dry platform. This is where the prevailing winds are running this way and this way. Uh, this, is, this is the summer winds coming off the sea here. This is the, the winter winds coming off the gulf from the mainland this way here. Then I'm looking at it for the community, the, 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 the waterway, the spit, the, the, and the ocean on this side, and looking at the area for restoration which Mark and Marmara are going through now. The freshwater zone, the freshwater mangroves are in here, and the community is up here. Uh, this is Marmara's country. This is other, other members of, her, of the community's country. And I'm designing a house up here, which is entirely different in many ways to the house here because of a different program. And it's very important in this region to have pods like this that you're able to 
have up off the ground so that the air can pass at your ankles, the air can pass at your waist, the air can pass at your shoulders, the back of your neck, your elbows, and these areas here. And if the air can't pass over those areas, then you're going to feel very hot. And if you're able to get the pass over, you get a tremendous cooling and a great comfort zone. So everything's taken off the floor so that you get that, that zone of comfort. And then here we have the parents to the west and the children to the east of them uh, all sleeping uh, on that side. So the important thing is that the, the, not that the children are all sleeping at facing east, the important thing is they are to the east of the parents. And I'm looking at various aspects of the design and the trees and the way people sit because they sit on the floor like this here um, as, a, as, as opposed to chairs. You'll see a couple of chairs in the house here. Those chairs are for me because I find it difficult to sit on the floor but they sit like this most of the time. And just design ideas, structural ideas, doing it in plywood, it's, it's the ways that sort of areas that you might deal with plywood. Um, and then these are the drawings, what I call my composite section, which, which is the section of the building, but it, it shows in dot, dotted line uh, all the way through how the waste gets out, comes along, moves through here, coming down, collected here, how the, where the toilet sits in its waistline, how the vent, vents work, how the lighting might come in through this area here. And then the final plan, uh, I had all these bathing spaces on the original plan outside here. I would got, got the plans uh, ready to almost start construction and my client said to me now about these bathrooms, Len, she said, you, you know, there are things with Aboriginal, Aboriginal life for women that you can't have a, a man going past walking outside and you're just, just that far away. I've got to get as far removed as reasonably I can from a male outside here. So I said, fine, Marlborough, I'll change the design quickly. So uh, I, I had to redesign the whole thing, in fact. To get the, the <laughs> get the bathing back, and I had to redraw it. It's a complete redrawing. And so this is a uh, uh, bauxite from the region. It's a major bauxite resource in the area, and I th the, the stuff blows everywhere, goes onto everything. And so I decided I'd have to find this is this is the colour of it here, a a uh, ultraviolet stabilised uh, pigment that would uh, allow me to desire to have the building this colour, and it's also a very Aboriginal colour, uh, used in a lot of their paintings. Uh, it's, just, it's just a very powerful <coughs> colour. And, and my client not only found me, um, because through a, a, a project I had done, she said, if you're going to have a white fella's place, uh, uh, then a black fella could live in one of those. And, uh, and she was probably right. Um, and she said, and I've got uh, a very good friend of man down in Gosford, which is uh, just north of Sydney, and this is as far removed from Yurikawa, just about as, as you can get. Uh, Melbourne's just a bit further. And uh, we designed the building in components. Uh, we, we framed it up down in uh, this area north of Sydney. And uh, uh, we then uh, were able to, the, these guys, as build it's 20, it's 30, 33 at this stage, put it together in these two containers. He designed every component to fit just fantastic. So the whole house is packed up in that. That is the complete house. And then the house as it's now constructed. Um, <coughs> these are all flaps at the back here, which prevent the, the summer sunrise, which is 30, uh, about 30 degrees south of east, setting 30, 30 degrees south of west. So you, you prevents all that sun, but it collects the wind coming through and drives it through the house. There's the slot at the floor level. There's mesh in there to stop the evil spirits. The mesh is sufficient to stop the evil spirits coming in that zone through the floor there. But in sitting down, look at see a kid here. This is the television. Uh, looking at television, it's in that cupboard there. Uh, can sit here, get air passing over his body all the time. These are Venturi system tube developed by an Australian up in Queensland, a marvellous system, getting a, a positive pressure this side, negative pressure developed here with the tube down into the house. It draws out the hot air, which allows you to use absolutely bare tin on the roof system. And the house, if I've made any failure in this house, as a major failure, it's not major, but it is a little too cool in the tropics where, you, where most, most houses require phenomenal air conditioning. And this is the, before it was completed, this is the western end, and this is Marmara's room, and that special window there so that she can sit up in bed, look out of there, and see her childhood billabong. And the house, in relation to the beach, the beach is just in front here. The various systems of, of, of ventilation, propping that is now, you'll see by gas cylinders, here it is in through here. So the whole house is a dry platform that can be flapped open, uh, almost has the quality of a tiger moth. And uh, life on the, in the house is the, the platform and the steps. And here they are, the fish has just had it. He actually got it with his spear. Uh, they, they're hunting and uh, these are the builders through here. This is the, the celebration of, of the taking out of the house. 
and the Aboriginal people have been given a building, I believe they can live in a dig with dignity. Look, television's a very big part. Every time you look at it, you'll see the kids here looking <laughs> at, at it. And, and, and they, 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 they have videos, and they video uh, all events and video time. And the kids will look at these things ten times a week. They just think it's fantastic to see some great event or a crocodile passing, passing through or the or gathering of the eggs. They just think it's wonderful. Here's the building with the things shut down, so during cyclonic conditions, you can shut this thing down pretty well. On this side here, we have all slatted floor. It's intended, but it hasn't been necessary at this stage. They have big blinds up at this point through here. You can bring them down like sails onto, a, uh, onto rubber straps so that like a sail in the wind, uh, you, can, you, can the, you can get the wind, let the, the, the pressure on the, on the sail will allow, allow it to stretch and belly, and then as the wind eases or takes up, it pulls back, and any water that comes in is driven in through the floor. These are all slatted boards, and there's a whole series of there, which you'll see in a moment, I think, of uh, particular slats for, for where you could tie and let the water through. Here again, the sleeping spaces, little platforms through here, where the air moves up through here, over here, and over here. All the doors have louvers on them to allow the air to pass through, and each time you move through into a bedroom and out of a bedroom, you can get a view to the outside, not locked away from the elements. It is, it is a platform only that allows you to be able to experience the site from many different places. This is the site from the rear of the, of the house, which is this beautiful freshwater mangrove forest. And this is what it's like outside, having breakfast in the morning. I just pull the screen through because you can see that's what it's like looking through that screen. You see very little of what's going on inside, but from, from within to looking outside, it is fantastically uh, defining in terms of the reduction of light levels. And then when all these things are flapped open uh, with the gas cylinders, the gas stays, uh, it's, just, it's just a big platform. Again, here we are here. This is where it's very open at the edge, allowing the first line of sand that comes into the house to drop down and through back into the, back into the ground. And the house is seen from the billabong. And it, this is, reminds me of this is life as it has been with Aboriginal people. And in many ways, this here has the, the quality that I'm trying to achieve for the people of this region. And this is the sort of house that's been, been given by the church to the people. Uh, that they thought that they could actually uh, humanise these people into, into this sort of environment. Um, it's uh, such a disaster. It's such a disaster when you look at this architecture and the, the horribleness of it. And this is the, the, the more recent plan on a very quite steep site where the entrance again is only down the side. And you can continue down through. You can make a decision to come into here and then you open into this space uh, here. This is... This is uh, uh, um, this is north on this direction, north direction here. This is the parents' bedroom here. And in this case, the children are all east, uh, or very close to east. And the, the bathing space is in here. And then the whole of the screens on this area here can be slid right back into that zone there. And the screens all slid back into this zone here. And I'll just give you the, the, that. They, this is the actual site. This is what they look out onto. This is, this is the sleeping spaces through here that have got all these windows that can flap up. Uh, it's a pitched roof uh, house on a square plan. These are all Venturi tubes that pick up the heat and take it out of the ridge line. Uh, and these are the way all the screens fold back into this zone here. And the screens here all fold into that zone there. Then all the windows can flap open. And there's ventilation in this, air, in this zone here. And there's ventilation in the same way occurring there. All the cupboards are kept down. And all the walls are done with louvers so that the air can pass straight through those walls. This is the entry side coming down. They have a car that they'll put in through here. And there's a relationship between this building and this building. They'll be, they'll be different buildings, but they're very similar in most ways. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. to leave, they could leave very quickly, but I think we should still have some time for questions. So, uh, Come on, you can't let me get away with that. <laughs> for those of you who are leaving, I should at this point remind you that, of course, part of the reason we're here is also to celebrate the publication of the new book on Glenn, which I think is available from Triangle, just in the South Jewish Yes. Yes. 
Yes. So, maybe while people are moving, there was one um, quick question about the uh, the house that you showed with uh, recycled materials. Mm. I was very interested in the actual procedure, the way you did it, because. Of course, in many of the projects, you were showing how you're detailing from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. How did you know about the kind of materials that you were going to mm. get? I think something about the procedure. Yeah, was um, I was very lucky in that I was able to select the builder for that particular house. Did you all understand the question? Is what what was the procedure that allowed me to design a house using recycled materials? In other words, what's the procurement me te technique? of being able to get the right size materials. Well, the, 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 the thing was that um, in very close cooperation with my engineer and close cooperation with the builder, we had many occasions where we had designed the size of elements in the building and the builder came back and said, rang the engineer and said, look, I can't get it to that side, but I can get an F28 uh, that's going to be 250 by 75. And the engineer said, that's great. Uh, you don't have to put them at 450 centres any longer. We can put them at uh, at, at uh, 1.2 centres. And he, uh, he said, uh, what sort of thickness of flooring have you got? And Andrew said, well, I've got flooring here I, that, that's of, of material that's actually, I've got stuff that's 37 millimetres thick. He said, look, bump it up to about 1,300 millimetres and you'll be right. So in, 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 in actually working with this technique, you have to be entirely flexible all the way along, not to oversize uh, members, so you all of a sudden start wasting the material again, but to actually start, have the flexibility, so if you've got a module, for example, uh, in that particular case it was 2.4 metres, then I, I can go uh, uh, the, the 1.2 metres, 2.4, so we're able to put certain numbers of joists in to measure, to, to work for the thickness of flooring that we had that would carry that floor for the size of span and the loading on that floor. So we're the whole time moving with that level of flexibility. I'd be getting many phone calls, I can assure you as an architect, about, look, I've got this material, where can we use this material? So I'd go to Jim, my engineer, and say, look, he's got all this material for the, the roof joists uh, possibility, what span can we put it to? And so we'd, we'd look at the, the metal roof, and we'd say, well, the metal roof can, can go up to a maximum span of 1,600 in between and 1,200 in span. And, and, and we'd look to see um, what the cost of that material was compared with the cost of... Uh, uh, over, oversizing the timber and we say to him, look, no, we don't want to oversize the timber, we'll, we'll, we will wait a little and find another source. And he was on to sources all over New South Wales because he's put his business up now in sourcing second-hand timber. And he will go away for, for a week at a time and they'd be pulling down a bridge that or ordinarily would have been put to put, put a fire or blown up with gelatinite 25 years ago and just left, left, left to rot and he's able to go and unbolt all these things. He, he also, big bolt holes that are in the middle of it, he actually cuts the timber, resurfaces it, and where a bolt hole is, he's got these techniques of plugging and, and glues that are terrific glues that hold the plugs in place so that they're not placed at the edges of the beams, they're always in the centre. Um, he's very skillful at dealing with how you, how you source timber and the sizes you use and the degree of flexibility that one must have in being able to to uh, use the material appropriately. Does that answer that? Yeah, okay, good question. Um, <coughs> I uh, have worked with perhaps... Uh, I guess the question is, do I work with the same builder or do I go to tender like normal architects do, probably? Uh, I've, I've added the second part. Um, some buildings I go to tender on, to, to tender with. Um, other buildings I don't. I have, over the years, probably worked with maybe 30, 40 different builders. And in that time, I can say of the 40 builders I've worked with, I have perhaps eight that are exceptional. 
and by exceptional I mean they are fair, they are honest, they will do a marvellous job and they price at a mid-range level that they don't price giving a suicide price where you, the architect, pays for the difference between the low price and the proper price through the number of site visits you have to make and the ulcers you have to get cured by going to the doctor. Um, I will only these days work with builders that if a client comes with a builder, I will investigate that builder like the builder's never been investigated in his life before and I will set out right from the beginning with that builder and ask the client to fly that builder into Sydney and I'll spend time with that builder and show the, the level and expectation and the demands I'll place on that builder. Now I have very good relationship with the builders I have worked with for years. And so I have one Finnish family of builders that I've been working with since 1967. Um, when I first went on to the job, it was a marvellous experience. Uh, Finns have a great reverence for architecture and architects, unlike most other parts of the world. And Yoko and Lasse called all the men to attention and in Finnish and brought them all together. And this was my first job in private practice. And he introduced me to each one of them, individual, one by one, shaking the hands. They took that hat off and at the end of it, Lasse said to me as the senior member, we greatly look forward to a long career with you. And it is now 1995, going 96, and they are still doing work with me. Finnish builders. I can say the same of a Dutch builder. I can say the same thing of an English builder, two English builders. Uh, I'm, I unfortunately can't say the same thing of an Australian-born builder to this stage, but it might happen. Um, and I'm working with other Italian builders, uh, marvellous builders. And so what I say to clients is I have the availability of up to six builders. There are two of them that are absolutely appropriate for this job. We can either go to tender on this project or we do it on a negotiated contract. So right from the outset, I'll, I will start working with the builder. Uh, for example, on the Aboriginal house, I know that who the builder is going to be because it's the community builder. Uh, I negotiated with the community builder the design of the building. There was input the whole way through. At the end of the process, the builder exposes all the figures. I give it to a quantity surveyor, unlike your quantity surveyors that direct the architecture, and tell the, ask the quantity surveyor, does it fit the bill or not? And he looks at it and says, look, everything's honest, it's fine. Pro proceed. Uh, we're not directed by quantity surveyors in my country and not going to be. Um, um, and it's, it's very important, although it, the, I, I must now support the quantity surveyor in the big project that I'm doing in Melbourne at the moment in association with Bates Smart. We've used the quantity surveyor the whole way down the line at every move we've made and they've been marvellous because the, the project's a, a $13 million university building that I'm doing with, uh, with Robert Bruce of Bates Smart. And that ha has come in very well and I can assure you working with another architect on this basis is a, is a very, very positive experience for me because I have such respect for this, th this man and it's a very nice thing to achieve. Uh, and that was um, uh, unlike a negotiated contract, that was to tender. But um, quantity surveyors are very important to our activities. But they are like anything else, uh, they are a part of it they're not the directors. And if we've, we've lost our sense of direction and directing what we want to do, we're in troubles. And I think that's one of the great difficulties of our position in our societies now is that we actually have allowed other people to do things that we ought to be doing ourselves. Um, and the sense of responsibility that accompanies that is very, very great. Uh, the, uh, uh, so I, I have not had a client in the last 10 years. I mean, if they wait two and a half years, they listen to anything, I guess. Um, but I, I recommend, they say, look, we want one of the houses that you design. We want it to be the, the level you want. Uh, so long as it fits our budget, what more can they ask? I mean, if it, they, they could go to somebody a little bit cheaper, I guess, and get it ba ba built badly. Why do they want to do that? If we've got the funds to do it, we keep it as economical as possible and, and push it as far as we can. Uh, I guess that's trying to be sensible.
Answer that. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's a question that came up several times today during interviews. Um, you know, the Pacific Rim is a Pacific Rim, but there are so many cultures in that Pacific Rim. And I know there are architects in the world that know that they can build in every city and every country and every culture uh, appropriately. Um, I don't think I can do that so well. It takes me a long time. Within my own land, within the culture that's been there for 40, 50, 60,000 years, it took me three years to scratch the surface of understanding that culture. Now, if I go into, for example, Australians are heading into Asia, into, into Indonesia and Singapore and and everywhere else. And I think it's going to come to a very sticky end because there are so many things we are doing that are so totally inappropriate in my view that we're not really understanding at all. And, and what's actually happening is that the, the Pacific Rim cultures are looking for the things that we have because we have them because it's a level of status. Now, the answer is yes, I could work in the Pacific Rim, but I really feel I should be living with the people that I'm designing that for for some time to understand the cultural factors. I mean, to understand it, from the, the Asian perspective, how you enter a building, which side you enter from, what are the numbering of the streets, what's the feng shui of all this, uh, how you deal with it. I know the questions to ask, it doesn't take a long time. I don't know whether I've got long enough to live for it, learning all that. I've got so much to do in my own country that I don't know whether I need to go any further than the shores. And so I have rejected work in, in, uh, in, in the United States on the southern parts in Arizona, Tucson in Arizona, where I've been invited to do the Ar uh, Arizona Sonora Desert Museum. I've, I've, I've uh, rejected work in uh, New Jersey in the United States. I've rejected work in Helsinki uh, because of the, the, the cultural uh, separation that I don't understand. And to work in the Pacific Rim, there are too many countries uh, on that Pacific Rim that share the, the ocean, but we don't share absolutely everything else. And it's very important to understand those differences. And I don't understand them. I'm prepared to admit I don't understand them. I know a lot of my profession is not prepared to admit that. Does that answer that? Right, let's get one thing straight from the beginning, and that is suburbia was given to us by you, number one. Uh, it's our birthright. We believe, or we're told, the British sent uh, many of your nationals to our land, and after two years of good behaviour, they were pardoned, and they came from sometimes back-to-back -back housing, which was considered the worst housing ever post-Industrial Revolution, to have e existed, and the last thing they were going to develop in this brand new place that you're going to you conquered was to produce back-to-back -back housing, uh, an, an urban development. Uh, it was fine for the workers to live close together uh, in Paddington and places like that, but it wasn't fine for the, for the, the the gentry that were coming there. The gentry had to have their own plot and their own house on it. So we get that very clear from the beginning. It was you that gave us this, thank you very much. Um, and second point is, uh, the dying city uh, might very well be symptomatic of what's going to happen to all cities. There's great precedent for cities th that have died. And it may very well be the beginning of all cities dying now. And it may very well turn out that the model you gave us was the most appropriate. Who knows? But can I say the infrastructure, that the, the actual pressure on infrastructure, particularly the way and the time our cities were developed. You see, you, d you developed, oh, it's very easy for me to say, this is great. Um, it's very, e it, it, you developed our cities from a shipping industry base. And therefore, 
from the shipping base, the port was so important. Now, the port is a marvellous place to develop from, but you only get half a development in a sense because the port is on the edge of the coast in our land. It's no big river system as such. So in, this, in the port, you've got the coast, the ocean, the Pacific Ocean here or the Indian Ocean, what it might be, and then the centre of the city is right on that edge. You might get three kilometres from the centre of the city back to the ocean, and so you're essentially developing on a semicircular basis. We're not getting any of the round potential of keeping things closer as such, although we could have kept things closer. Now, what is happening, of course, is that the less capable of being able to afford to live centre are being pushed further and further out. They're the very same people that require two cars. But the infrastructure, the reason they require two cars, is that the main traffic points are from the city in, a, in the radial terms going to the outer edges, and the further you go out, the further these points are, are apart. And the further they're apart, the more difficult it is to link them across this way. So you've, these people have got to come back to the city and go back that way. It's a shocking system, but it, it is inev inevitable on the transport system that we have developed. Now, recognising that the whole transport system may very well change in the next 20 years, because we may be very well working from computers from our rooms, one room in our house might need to go to the city at all. What happens to the city then? I love urban living. I love the city in so many ways. But the city may very well not be here, as we understand it, in 50 to 100 years' time. It may be an entirely different concept as we live in it. And so I don't know where it's going. But the issue is the very people that live out here are the very people that are putting pressure on the centre to have the things of the people in the centre, and only the wealthy live in the centre. And when the wealthy are only living in the centre, they're, they're the most vulnerable, they come into a, a very small, tight community. They're the ones that are going to be robbed. All of a sudden, you get a breaking down in the society. They're forced out of the city finally. They can't live in the city. You see it in the, in the United States. Things like this are happening. And it, chances are the city can break down by its very economic structure from the, the, the wealthy are getting wealthy, the poor are getting poor. And so I don't know the answer to your question. Uh, I think it's, a, it's a, in a sense, a, a question that has no answer for me at this stage. But let me say, um, I wouldn't like to live in the western suburbs of Sydney. I would dislike it I intensely. But I'll tell you what, ask them what they think, and they think it's fantastic. Many of them think it's a great way of living. And I don't think it's that good at all. I think it's very deadly. But on the other hand, move, uh, move out of London uh, uh, 10 kilometres, 8, 10 kilometres, you ha don't have any difference. It's basically the same. The cities around the world. You go to Paris. I mean, talk, talk to the Parisians. They say so three kilometres outside is the garbage dump of, of Paris. Uh, this is what they tell me. And, and these are these people like Siriani and, and uh, others tell me, look, Paris is only the centre. The rest of it is just horrible. Now, cities have got a problem. Uh, the problem is people. Uh, <laughs> and recognising that, that in Paris, I think there are 60,000 cats and 80,000 dogs or something, or, uh, and uh, you, you're no different. There are big pressures born on, on, on the community just from animals alone. I don't think I've answered your question, but go ahead. <laughs> Did anybody, everybody hear that? Um, the, the question is, what has generated my great interest in the earth sciences and the processes, processes uh, of, of, of working in, in, in architecture? Um, I have to say that from very early childhood, we were given this. In 1949, for example, my father was firing Australian native plant seeds while everybody was growing roses um, in the oven. He put them in the oven to break them open and at a given temperature, and he also poured boiling water over the acacia seeds to crack them open so that you could propagate these, these things. Uh, we, we were very early age understood about firing of the landscape, uh, 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 understanding how the propagation takes place. Uh, my father bought, uh, <coughs> when he came down from New Guinea, 
having polluted parts of New Guinea so, un so terribly, uh, became an environmentalist. And uh, there's nothing like a reformed polluter to become an environmentalist. And uh, uh, as, as children, he would, uh, uh, he would show us how degradation was taking place through high uh, nutrients uh, uphill from where, where he had this land and how it was destroying it. And so what he did, he would go into the land and take these pieces of land where it had the higher nutrients and propagate the plants in that soil and return the plants to the higher water table level in the higher nutrients where they were able to survive. And so he regenerated these things. He took me from, for example, on the hillside at Clontarf where I grew up and looking at the Angophra costata, which is the most wonderful tree in Sydney, and looking at how it grows at the bottom of that hill, going halfway up the hill and then right to the top of the hill and looking at the bottom of the hill where the nutrients are higher, where the water table is higher, where the wind pressure is le least, going halfway up, how it varies there, the water table is, is, is less, uh, the wind pressures are higher, the nutrients are not as great. And you go to the top of the hill where it's leached out completely, there are very few nutrients, the wind pressure is at highest, and the water table is, is, is furthest from it. And so the plant is surviving to struggle. So at different points you understand the process of survival of the plant and how it changes its form as a, as a consequence of its place. And that in itself is very important to understand. And every time anybody threw food out of the car window, we had the first back-to-front car, the Sudi Banker from America, 1949. Does the lights going home? Come. <laughs> and uh, and he had belt, belt to, a, to a halt, jump out of the car, say, kids, get out and pick up that rubbish, and put it into the car. And the next thing you know is he's going 70, 80, 100 kilometres an hour chasing the car that threw the stuff out, biffing his horn, and then pulling over. They're friends of ours, well, these, these kids, and stopping the car, and they say, wave to us, and, and he says, no, over, over, and he get out on the side and say, look, rub, this, this is yours, you dropped it out of the car. And they said, no, it's just rub. He said, it's exactly right, take it home and put it in the bin. Well, compost it. He used to say, well, I suppose this is pretty impressionable and so embarrassing to you as a kid. <laughs> I mean, it's to your friends, it's horrible. <laughs> Go to school the next day and they say, this guy's dad's an eccentric. He's really, he's mad, he's mad. This is 1949. Uh, does that sort of... <laughs> yeah, yeah, and many other things. Then one gets an interest in it. And th th that interest then develops oneself. One learns it oneself. You start to understand the work of Bill Mollison in the permaculture processes of the land, you start to understand Alex Podolinsky in Australia about biodynamic farming and all those sorts of things become integral to the way one is working. And then that wind pressure, wind flow, blight, uh, uh, process. Process is very important. Process is really important. How a thing is constructed is very, very important. You can actually construct a building on a site that finally might look very easily done, but it destroys the whole site you're building on. I have funny notes on my working drawings to my builders. I put a note on it and say, this is a builder's working area. Do not go outside this area. This is a very sensitive piece of land. And I went down to the site one day, and the builder was really anxious. I only gave him a short notice. And I saw him there working flat out. And he'd, he's only that far outside the fence with this rubbish. He was like absolutely beyond anxiety. He was sick with worry about my coming down because he had gone just outside the working area I had defined for him. Now, that's very important to understand. A builder must understand that, that if you work outside that, you're destroying that. And builders will, builders will sp spread out the whole site. They'll go as far as they can. Put rubbish everywhere. Pour paint over anything. I'm doing a site for my brother at the moment, a house. And there's these beautiful ro volcanic rock outcrops. Granite, these, these things coming out of the ground, great shafts. And I put the living room there. And in the room, there's these beautiful things jumping out like this. Now, I know what's going to happen. The painter's going to get on the job and think this is a great place to tip his paint out on these things <laughs> and destroy it all. I've got a note on it. Painter, beware. Do not put this here. Plumber, do not put your machinery here. But I've got all these notes. And I look at them and think, this guy's mad. But they remember, 